morning, Innovation Church. How are you this morning? Excellent. I'm doing well. Hey, would you stand with us as we continue to uh, worship this morning?
tell you I was so happy that she's back home and and I'm trying to um, I'm trying to get a sense of you know since I don't know what it feels like to to really be there with Christ face to face um, I'm trying to equate that to you know or at least learn a little from that and, and as I think of how happy I am to see my family return home right and get, trying to make a sense of what that would feel like is understanding that, you know, Christ came, all right? Try to think of that in your own life when, when a loved one is, a, is away for a season um, and they return home. Try to think of that feeling that as we put that in perspective, we say, wait, Christ came. He came and paved the way for us. That's far beyond anything, amen? That's far beyond that my, my wife returned home or my, or my daughter returned home or my son coming back from deployment. That's far beyond anything amen so I, I just wanted to share that with you and we're going to do this chorus maybe i don't know one two maybe i don't know how many times we're going to just we're going to sing this chorus for a minute and however it applies to you try to try to tap into that feeling just for a bit as we sing this amen we If you're visiting here for the first time, we say welcome. Uh, we appreciate you. Come on, let's give first-time guests a warm welcome this morning.
We're so glad that you can join us here on campus and those who are uh, viewing online. We appreciate you. It's always a, a joy to see the body can get together in, 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 a, in a, at least maybe for once a week or twice a week and we can do corporate worship. Amen. That's always a blessing. We're going to continue to worship this morning and uh, just again, feel free to join in. We're, we're pretty casual today except for Ron. He didn't get the memo. But uh, <laughs> hey, just, just have fun this morning. Amen. <laughs> church the ocean Praise, we exalt you. 
because you are worthy. You are King of Kings. You are Lord of Lords. You are the great I am. We magnify your holy name, God. Be glorified in this place this morning, oh God. Be glorified. Be exalted, oh God. Meet with your people, oh God. We offer up our praises to you, oh God, that it might be a, an offering unto you, that your name would be glorified, that your name would be exalted. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We bless you. We worship you, oh God. We magnify your holy name. We magnify your holy name, oh God. You are worthy. You are worthy. Hallelujah. 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 We bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. As we continue to worship this morning, the pastors and deacons will be available at the altar, uh, make themselves available to you to pray with you, to pray for you. Whatever you're going through at this uh, today, this moment, I encourage you to allow your pastors and deacons to pray over you. Amen? Amen? The scripture clearly tells us if we, if we come together when we pray, right? James also talks about if, if, you know, if we're sick in our body, come and let the elders pray for you. Amen? Amen? <laughs> Folks, we need to stand on the word of God. Amen? Hallelujah. So again, if, if you would like prayer, allow your pastors and deacons to pray over you this morning as we continue to sing, um, sing about the goodness of God. the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Come on church, jo join me. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your
worship you, oh God. We bless your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. We worship you, oh God, because you're good. You're worthy. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. Come on, church, let's bless him this morning. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh my God I feel like God just revealed something to me about that last line that there might be so much pain represented in this room there might be so many difficult challenges represented in this room there might be so much confusion about life and what you're going through in this room but there's nothing more powerful than to say, but I'll worship your holy name. But I'll worship your holy name. I might not understand why I'm going through this, but my feet are on holy ground. But I'll worship. I'll lift you up. I can barely pick my hands up, but I'll worship your holy name. And there's nothing more powerful than that stance. I might not know, but I'll continue to worship. I won't stop. <sighs> what a beautiful thing that we get to bless the Lord back in return for his blessings, his faithfulness, Lord God. So hear our prayers and hear our songs, God, as we lift them up to you, God. I'm reminded of God's faithfulness this morning. As one of my students, Mom Friday, Brandon's mom, Brunilda, had a brain stroke Friday, 11 a.m., completely unresponsive. But praise God, by 4 o'clock, she started to wake up, God. And we lift up your faithfulness right now. We lift up your faithfulness. Right now, we acknowledge that we, we might not want to be here but we, we're not where we could be, God. You have brought us here, God. Continue to pray for her full recovery. But I can just feel a sense of you guys. We're all going through life. So many difficulties, God. So I want to pray for each and every one of you, God. I thank you that the people in this room woke up and said, I, I don't feel you. I don't know why I'm going through this. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to bring my family to church. Those are the people I'm praying for right now, God. I pray right now for divine healing where people are sick. God, I pray for divine restoration in families and marriages right now. Your power can overcome the things society say can't. God, your power is greater. You are greater. So I pray for the people represented in this room. These are your beloved children. God, you love them. I pray that you would show them right now that things will start to change right now. That momentum will start to take place, God, that they will start to feel encouraged, that they will start to feel your Holy Spirit, that they will start to feel that you are real, you are alive, and there's power represented in this room because you are here, God. I pray for the, couple, the, the families going through financial struggles, God. I pray for a deeper trust right now. I pray for a deeper reliance, God, that they will completely fall back into your arms and say, God, I can't do it, but you can, but you can, but you can. So I thank you, God. So I give it up to you right now, and we lift you up, God. 
God, and we bless your name because you are holy and you are worthy, God. We'll bless your name. We won't stop. We're going to say thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing in my life. Thank you for the restoration of my family. I am sick, but I am expecting healing. My family is broken apart, but I'm expecting to, for you to mend them. In this moment, God, we turn to you, God. You're the only healer. You're the only provider, God. We thank you right now for what you're going to do in our lives, God. You are alive, and we thank you this morning, God, that you have come down to save us, God. Our problems aren't so big when we look at your face. Our problems aren't so big when we stay at the face of heaven, when we look to Jesus, God. So I thank you. We declare as a body we will lift you up, God. Our feet are on holy ground. We are okay. We are protected. We are safe and sound. We are home, God. So we just thank you, God. Hear our pray, God. Hear our praise. Praise him, church. Thank you, God. Thank you, church. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Yes, God, sing this out. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Yes, God, this is your opportunity. Praise him like you've never praised him before. Like never before, God. church praise the living God praise the living God praise the living God the breathing God have to know you have to know that the Holy Spirit is dancing and singing right among us right now oh Lord you know Jesus is running up and down oh Jesus thank you for meeting us showing us continual continual awareness of who you are God let's say amen amen have a seat have a seat In an obscure mining town in northern Asia, needy children are housed in a government facility. Orphaned and abandoned from birth, their lives would seem hopeless. But God had another plan. After sensing the Spirit's leading, Steve is showing compassion to the least of these. Working with the government to rehabilitate and revitalize the lives of dozens of special needs children. He is showing the love of Christ in practical ways. James talks about real and pure, true religion, caring for orphans. That spoke to me, and we felt like it was our responsibility to do something for them. Steve's first step was to bring in compassionate Chinese caregivers and train them to work with these special children. 
Our goal is really to share the gospel with our staff, with our neighbors, with the children. And really our focus has become sharing the gospel with our staff. This is our what you done all. When I came to the orphanage to work, I didn't know Jesus. Then I met Steve, and he told me about God's love. I accepted Christ, and now I have hope for the future. We've seen great transformation in these young girls' lives who've really been changed by the gospel. So really, that's our greatest joy and focus and pleasure at the orphanage is really pouring into our staff. By caring for Northern Asia's unwanted children and reaching out to caregivers who don't know Christ, God's love is being shown and hope is being restored. I can't do anything right. No wonder my boss won't promote me and my wife doesn't respect me. God's not finished with me yet. I can be the man he created me to be at work and at home. I can't believe he's acting like that. What a jerk. He must be having a really hard day. Maybe God put me here to make a difference in his life. I just can't stop doing this. I'm so frustrated with myself. I will always be this way. I can do this through Christ's strength. He will help me overcome. Succeeding at the big things has a lot to do with the little things. Thoughts, words, actions. Awesome, that's our next series coming up. I'm super excited about that. How, how many guys can relate to that idea of life? Just sometimes hearing, going back and forth. I just want to welcome you this morning. Thank you so much for being here. Um, let's just welcome our first time guests this morning as a church. Thank you so much for being here. I hope that you got a VIP packet. And in that packet, we'll love for you to just fill out some information um, so that we can give you a call during the week and tell you how glad we are that you came and send you a f some free gifts, which is awesome. The rest of you, if you could just fill out your name on the connection card, that would be great. I also want to welcome a new baby boy into the world. His name is William James Riviello. <laughs> Handsome. Almost as good looking as I am. <laughs> just kidding. Sorry. Um, as you guys know, today was race day, race Sunday. As soon as the service is over, we're going to have a picnic. Please stick around. And I believe a lot of the pastors are going to be running. I'm not sure how that's going to look, but I might collapse after the first, first round. But please stick around for the, for the picnic. Um, take this down on your calendar. Saturday, June 7th is a cleanup day here at Innovation. We need as many hands on deck as possible. We're going to be cleaning up the trailers amongst a few other projects that are happening. Um, so please write that down. June 7th, if you can come out, we would love that so much. Just a reminder that the closing clothing closet right now, which is packed full, they're not taking any donations right now or closed right now until July, I believe. And cool, let's pray. I'm so excited that you guys are here. I'm out of breath and my voice is gone already. I haven't even done anything. So let's pray. As always, we're going to pray over the tithe and offerings and our donations here this morning and pray over our local church today. That is St. Matthew's Church in East Strasburg. So let's pray. God, we thank you so much, as always, for the opportunity to give back what you give to us, God. We know that together we can accomplish so much for your kingdom but for your community here in the Poconos, God, to know that, that we're feeding families, to know that we're clothing families, God, and we're doing so much more, God. So I just thank you that we have the opportunity to be a part of this global Christian project of giving back to you, God. And we also lift up St. Matthew's Church, and I just thank you for that church, God, and I lift up their congregation and their staff. 
I pray that you would meet them this morning the way you met us, God. To know that you have a desire to always meet your children and always lavish your presence upon us. So I just pray that they would have a tremendous worship experience, God. That you would also bless their tithes and offerings, God. And continue to further that ministry to bless their community. So I thank you for them. And I thank you for these people in this building right now, God. Continue to lift them up. Amen. declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. God has a plan for all of us, and he doesn't want to see us harmed whatsoever. He doesn't want to see us get hurt. And he has a future for us, which is heaven. And sometimes things might not go as we had planned or we had thought, but he always prepares us for what's what's coming. And I just want to share a little, little story. Um, back in high school, I was in, in band and chorus. I was singing and playing percussion. And for concerts, I didn't want to go out on stage. And I knew it was coming. I knew I had to do it, but I just didn't want to go. And I, I would fake being sick. And I actually one time got out of going to a concert <laughs> because of it. Um, but, but since then, God has placed me on stage singing and playing an instrument. And just that's how God works. You know, he takes our weaknesses and turns them into his, into his, our strong points. So I'd like to share with you uh, Jeremiah 29, 11 on the keys. to harm you, 
it up for John. And Lauren, thank you. That was beautiful. Beautiful. So how y'all doing? Yeah. You ready for some hot dogs? I hope somebody brought beans because that's all I really look forward to. I want to, especially Hope. You know, Hope Siglin. I don't know if you know. Hope, are you in here? She's here. She's around somewhere. She's probably making the beans. <laughs> the, the point is, you want beans that if you, if you stick a fork in it, it just stays straight up. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? And, 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 if you, and if you feel something other than a bean, it, it, it's big chunks of bacon. I'm talking about heart stop and beans. Okay, that's what I'm looking forward to. Hopefully it'll be at the picnic. <laughs> you can't eat it every day, but from time to time you can eat it. Well, this is part three of the series, Money Tales, Stories Jesus Told About Money. Let me tell you a story about a man from Pennsylvania. He always dreamed of owning a cattle ranch, and he saved enough money eventually uh, purchased his dream ranch over in Wyoming, so I'm told. And after a few months, uh, his best friend flew out to, you know, see how things were going. He says, hey, what's the name of your ranch? And as it turned out, this gentleman had a hard time coming up with a name. He and his wife couldn't agree on anything. And so finally they decided to call it the Double R Lazy L Triple Horseshoe Bar 7 Lucky Diamond Ranch. And his friend was really impressed by this, and he asked, well, tell me, where, where's all the cattle? And the rancher, very new at his trade, of course, said, we had quite a few, but none of them survived the branding. Come on. None of them survived the branding. John, why don't you come on up, take the microphone. We're still thinking about beans and hot dogs and bacon here. Okay, so you're wondering, what does that have to do with anything? Well, it has to do with at least one thing, and that is this month we're focusing on ways that we can uh, more fully understand what Jesus had to say about money. And on occasion, uh, either I or Pastor Don, so far we've uh, mentioned, again, on occasion, tithing. And, and if we're not careful, we can get so caught up in trying to understand tithing, we may not really survive to get through to the real meaning behind the Lord's stories, which is the importance of life stewardship. And that's really what this series is about. Tithing is just a very, very small element of the entire package. This is what Jesus was getting at. And so in the first teaching, I was encouraging you to manage God's resources so that, as Jesus said, when you arrive in heaven, there will be people there who will say thank you for giving to the Lord. And so he told the story of a, of a, a crooked manager who used his bo boss's resources to purchase goodwill among others. Uh, and Jesus used that very unusual story to teach us that while we have an opportunity, we're to use our funds and our resources to influence people so that when we arrive in heaven, there will be friends there to welcome us. Now, Pastor Dawn gave a message last week for Mother's Day about a poor widow, and she had two small coins. And, and the reason, of course, for the teaching originally and why Dawn brought it last week is that Jesus wanted us to hear a story about a woman who otherwise would have not received our attention. In fact, no one would have ever noticed her, and we certainly wouldn't be talking about her today. Remember, it was Jesus who said, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. And so through this woman who gave so sacrificially, the Lord was teaching us that you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. And there's something that connects the two. And this woman put her money where her heart was. She gave the two coins, and she demonstrated extravagant love toward God. It wasn't about the coins, it was about her heart. And Jesus pointed her out to his disciples, and now, reaching across the centuries, we still look at this story to try to understand the true nature of the church of Jesus Christ. God wants worshipers that deeply love, 
that deeply love. And we give of our treasures, we give of our time, we give of our talents because we love. It's about so much more than tithing. It's about the totality of our lives in our Father's sight. And so today I want to talk with you about using what God has entrusted into our care. And we're looking at a story that has been heard many times across the years and in many churches, and maybe you're very familiar with it, but I hope we can bring out some, some new principles regarding this story. It's from Matthew's Gospel, and it's a parable. Sometimes we don't recognize where this parable takes place, so let me just tell you a couple of things. It's found in a section where Jesus has just shocked his disciples by saying that the great temple in Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. That concept is unfathomable. It had been over 500 years since Solomon's temple had been destroyed. And now, here we are five centuries later, we have Herod's temple. It's one of the true wonders of the world. Clearly, it could never be destroyed. And Jesus says, not one brick will be left upon another, not one stone. And it was uh, just absolutely unbelievable. It, it, it could not it could not be, it just simply couldn't compute for their understanding of reality. Something this immense, something this huge. This would be bigger than even the loss of, of the World Trade Center, the Twin Towers that we had back in 2001. So that could never go, and, and they went under attack. And so Jesus is prophesying, because he's also a prophet, that this is going to happen and the temple will be destroyed. And so his disciples ask him, and we find this in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, when will this happen? And then they connect it, thinking that Jesus is speaking about more. What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? It's a very challenging question, and Jesus gives a, a lengthy answer. He speaks about the temple being destroyed. It was destroyed less than 40 years later by the Romans in 70 AD, and so the prophecy was fulfilled. However, the sign of his coming is much more detailed. When Jesus first told this story, I don't think the disciples really understood what he was talking about. Why would he be speaking about his return? He's there now. There, he has not yet been arrested or crucified and risen and ascended to the Father saying, I will return. None of that has happened yet. Why would he be talking about his return? So he's, he's speaking of things that they really don't understand. They're listening, as we all can do at times. We listen, but we're not really taking it in. And what makes sense, or what helps this make sense, is that the Gospel of Matthew was almost certainly written after the destruction of Jerusalem. That which was unexpected and impossible to imagine had just happened. And the, and the, the Gospel is now being presented to a people who had seen the temple destroyed or at least had heard of it if they're not in Jerusalem or were not in Jerusalem on that day. And primarily Jesus is warning them and those of us who are listening today to be ready because he will come at an hour when it is least expected, when the unexpected will happen, when that which seemed impossible actually takes place. And so this is the context of the story that we'll be looking at today. In chapter 25, Jesus actually compares his return, his coming, or sometimes we say the second coming, to the ancient custom of the, of the bridegroom arriving in the middle of the night. This would have been true in that culture, and he speaks of it in Matthew chapter 25, says, therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Just as we do not know when the bridegroom will come, we don't know the day or hour that Jesus will return. And chapter 25 ends with the story of the separation of the sheep and the goats. That is, he has returned and he's beginning to separate out the nations and those who are in those nations based on their faith, based on how they live their lives and their faith in Christ. But sandwiched in between is the story that we're looking at this morning, which is today called the parable of the talents. And in verse 14, Jesus said, again, it will be like a man going on a journey. And the word again indicates that Jesus is using, again, one more parable to explain future events, that which will come. And the man going on the journey is undoubtedly Jesus himself. 
So we're going to walk through this story, and I think we'll discover seven lessons regarding stewardship that I think are worth knowing as followers of Jesus Christ. So let's pray, and we'll look at these lessons. Father, we thank you for the time we have here remaining this morning. We ask, Lord, that you would continue to direct our conversation, that as we consider these things, your Holy Spirit would be teaching us, would be helping us to not only understand, but to also speak back to you in the Spirit, saying, this will be applied in my life. This will guide me in the decisions I make. I will be directed by your voice within me. And Lord, this is our desire, that we would have this interaction with you, even as the word comes forth. And we thank you for it. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let me give you the first. We'll put these principles up on the screen. You have them in your notes as well, or at least a portion of them, because you might want to fill that other portion in. And the first is this. What we have is not ours. And so we'll begin the story, verse 14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. Clearly, it was not uncommon in, in that culture, and I don't think it would be uncommon today, for wealthy people to take long journeys. They have a lot of money. They don't need to always be thinking about generating more, and so they may travel. Uh, here in America, we may go to Europe and spend time over there or in other places around the world. Clearly, it was the same then, but before they leave, they would arrange to have things taken care of. Someone maybe who's going to pick up the mail or someone who's going to, uh, you know, feed pets if they have them, but... In this case, it's even more than that. This man who's going to be gone on this journey is going to delegate the control and multiplication of the wealth of his business to trustworthy employees. And I, I don't think there's any doubt in the minds of these servants that the property and the money still belongs to the master. Would you agree with me? He's the one going on a journey, but it's his wealth, it's his property, it's his money, it's his business, and he's entrusting it to these servants. They are the possessors of it, but not the owners. And that's a long biblical uh, uh, tradition, if you will, throughout the scriptures, going all the way back to the Psalm. Psalm 24, verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. So no matter who you are, where you are, where you live, what nation you're in, what company you may work for, what wealth you may have, what poverty you may wrestle with, whatever it is, the very clothing on your back, the chairs you're sitting on, everything belongs to the Lord. Everything belongs to God. This earth belongs to him. The prophet Haggai put it this way. The silver is mine, the Holy Spirit speaking through the prophet. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. Right around this point, I should have you take out your wallets, open up your purses, and show all that's in there and say, God, this is all yours. And for a follower of Jesus Christ, that's an obvious truth. For those who are trying to wrestle with this, they're not so sure. That wallet is firmly still tucked in. But we, we're thinking about these things as we're listening to the stories that Jesus told about money. And this master, <clears throat> this wealthy person who's going on the journey, he has the rights, <clears throat> excuse me, but, his, <clears throat> but his, his, his servants have the responsibility. He's the master. The servants are going to be the manager. I could say, and you could say, Lord, I'm the servant and you're the sovereign. I'm going to be entrusted with this, but it's all yours. Our days are in the Father's hands. Our gifts, our abilities, all that we are, are on loan from him. So we learn right here, the very first principle is our money is in advance, if you will. Everything you have, everything you possess, everything you've saved for retirement, if you're doing anything like that, everything that, and I hope you are, Everything that you are investing in any business, anything that you're doing investing here at Innovation, anything that, you ha that has anything to do with your time or your talents or your finances, whatever it may be, it all belongs to the Lord. And our money, our very lives are in advance from the Father. Our houses, our, our cars, our clothes, every possession doesn't belong to us. We really don't own anything. So if the Lord was to come and say, 
I require this of you, you would say, well, of course, it's yours. How, how could I do any, anything else? However, that principle is more often ignored by the church in America uh, than any other principle the Lord's ever taught as we continue the pursuit of the accumulation of wealth. So it's something to think about. The second principle I found here is this. We are given what we can handle. That would be financially, but that would be in all of life. We're given what we can handle. He goes on to say in verse 15, to one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent. Now these are not talents as in abilities or skills, although you could refer to it that way, but he's speaking of something different. And he did each according to, or he gave each according to his ability. Each, in other words, according to the servant's ability. And then he went on his journey. Let me give you a little background. A talent is about 75 pounds weight. It's actually a measure of weight, about 75 pounds. The value of a talent would have more to do whether it's uh, uh, 75 pounds of copper or 75 pounds of silver or, or 75 pounds of gold or whatever it may be. You know, it's, I just love it when things just appear. You know? <laughs> Let me come down and grab this and open it up. Uh, and so when we're speaking of talents, um, we're not speaking of our own skills or our own abilities, of course, but we are talking about uh, wealth. We're really talking about an accumulation of wealth. It would take an ordinary worker, here's an interesting little tidbit, about 20 years to earn one talent. If we would take a talent and put it into our economy today at an hourly wage, it would probably be equivalent to about $300,000. How many of you have a talent in your pocket? <laughs> so with, with that in mind, we're dealing uh, with a great deal of wealth. Now, that, some people have a more conservative F estimate, bring it down to about $30,000. But I think if we were to really look at it in today's economy, it would be about $300,000. Back when I was a young guy, $30,000. That was a joke. Oh, come on. <laughs> so the master gives his first servant five talents, which would be about one and a half million dollars. He gives the second one uh, two talents, that's approx approximately $600,000. The third steward got one talent, approximately $300,000. So even though there's a, there's a big difference between the five talent guy and the one talent guy, uh, there's still a lot of money involved here. Whether you have five or whether you have one, we're dealing with a great deal of money. And even that, I thought, was an interesting point regarding our father because God gives out of his abundance to all of us. Even those who have no interest in him, even of the, those of us who reject him, even those of us who harden our hearts, he still gives out of his abundance to us. The Lord would say that the, the rain or the, or the sun is going to shine, the rain is going to fall on the just and on the unjust. He's giving of his blessing, he's giving of his wealth to everybody, even when it's abused. But what I want you to notice is that each servant received talents according to his ability. So your responsibility is tied to your ability. God's kingdom purpose do not operate based on what's fair. You say, well, it's, it's not fair. This one has more and, and I have less. But it operates according to what is best. It operates according to what God knows regarding who we are and the design uh, of our lives. And, and, and if you have, because God has given, which is all of us, he expects us to manage his gifts within the boundaries of our ability, the ability that he has wired into us. He has wired an, a certain level of ability into you. It's not to say we should not try to exceed it, because if you try to exceed it, he's wired more ability into you. Otherwise, you wouldn't even be thinking along those lines. But how we deal with the wealth that's been entrusted to us, not just money, but the very air we're breathing, the life we're living, how we deal with this, the Lord already knows, according to this story. And our job is to be faithful with whatever amount we have to work with in our lives, who we are, how we think, how we, how we choose, how we decide. Do we trust that God knows more about us than we know about ourselves? And that's what this story is getting at. Let me give you a third principle. We must invest 
what we have been given. We must invest what we've been given. Look with me at verse 16. The man who received, the man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. I want you to notice he didn't waste any time. Immediately he went to work on the investment and he doubles his, his master's portfolio, as we would say today. He's doubled his master's wealth. The guy with the two talents does the same thing. It doesn't say that he went at once, but the result is the same. He works very hard and he doubles it. We know that he worked hard because, after all, the money was doubled. And so he has gained more wealth for his master. And then we come to the crux of the story, verse 18. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Now, we really don't have any specific instructions from the master in regards to the money. He just gives it. There is no instruction regarding how it should be invested or how it should be multiplied. But nevertheless, the first two servants go to work and multiply their investment. The one talent guy, if you will, was a bit of a slacker. He goes off and he buries his blessing, which wouldn't be unusual in that generation, a little bit more unusual in our culture, but it still happens. The practice of hiding valuables in the ground quite common back then. It's one of the safest and yet least profitable ways of protecting your possessions. You could do the same thing. You could take your wealth and put it in some safety box and bury it in your backyard. And most likely, if you're careful with how you go about it, no one will ever find it. It's very safe. However, as our government keeps printing more and more money, <laughs> the value of your money that you put in the ground is becoming less and less to the point where you're actually, not only have you not safeguarded it, but you're actu it's actually becoming less and less valuable because you haven't invested it, you haven't done anything with it. You all understand how that works, right? If you don't, you need to get into one of our financial classes or meet with one of our deacons. We'll explain the, the, uh, the way of life to you of how, it's, how money functions in our economy. So what we do with what God has entrusted to us is really pivotal in this story that Jesus is telling. I remember a story of a boy that I read not too long ago who lived many years ago. True story, his name was Antonio. And he, he's one of these guys that always wanted to sing, but you really don't want to sit next to him when he's singing. How many of you are sitting next to someone like that right now? Come on, raise your hands, you see? Now I got you in trouble, I did that just for you. I, ha I was sitting next to Gene this morning. He came in early on one of the words. And I didn't even want to look back at him. because he's, he's got a good voice. He, he belts it after. He makes a joyful noise. But he came in a little early. I can't remember what song it was. And I'm sure the band heard him come in, you know. Uh, sometimes we, you know, the band was talking about this earlier. Sometimes as a drummer, Sam was playing drums today. And, and maybe someone's out there and they're clapping just a little offbeat. And the drummer's trying not to go off beat. I mean, you know, we have people right here in this group who have absolutely no rhythm and no voice. God bless you. God loves you. God loves you. I, I have a little bit of rhythm. I have no voice, so I'm, I'm in there with you. Uh, I, I used to actually lead at the first church that Don and I planted. I used to lead the song service. I learned how to play guitar at the time, and I could do all the basic songs that we sang back then. Uh, and, uh, you know, you only needed to know three chords to do a song back then, and I knew those three chords. And then I would tell people to sing loud or you'll hear me. <laughs> and they sang loud. You know, we, we have people who are like that. Antonio is just such a, just a squeaky kind of voice. He goes out for a very famous boys' choir. If I was to mention the name, you'd know what I'm speaking of. And he fails to get selected, of course. Then he wants to play uh, the violin, and he's taking violin lessons. And his neighbors actually came and knocked on the door and persuaded his parents to make him stop. <laughs> this is, that's not a good sign, you know. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. He still wanted to make music, and, and uh, if friends are giving him a hard time. He only had, he had one talent. His talent was taking a piece of wood and whittling. You know what whittling is, right? You could make a whistle, or you could make something out of a piece of wood, maybe a, a horse or something. And when he got older, this served him well because he was able to apprentice with a violin maker. 
and his knack for whittling it grew into the skill of carving, and, uh, and the hobby uh, became a craft. And he became very, very proficient in creating these violins. In fact, he worked very patiently, creating violins for an entire lifetime. Uh, by the time he died, he had left uh, over 1,500, over 1,500 violins, and each one bearing the label that read Antonio Stradivarius. Maybe some of you know the name. Okay, a Stradivarius today would sell for easily $100,000, probably a good deal more, if you could get someone to sell it. This is the young boy with the squeaky voice, the one who tried to play violin but couldn't play. Uh, but, you know, what's amazing is he can't sing, can't play, but his responsibility was only to use his ability. And that's what Jesus is getting at. By the way, his violins, of course, today are still making beautiful music, even though it wasn't his gift personally to make that music. It's been said, and maybe you've heard it, our potential is God's gift to us. What we do with it is our gift to God. So we're only, you know, it, go, you know, it, it seems like such a cliche, but you're the only person on earth that can use your ability. You know, there's not another person who can utilize your ability. God has given you X amount, whatever that is, and the question is, what are you going to do with it? And that's what this story is, is all about. Are we investing what we've been given regardless how, of how much it is, or maybe we've buried our blessing and kept it hidden from others? Well, let me give you the fourth principle. A day of, uh, of accounting or a day of accountability is coming. Here's where the story shifts gears a little bit. We look at verse 19. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. Now, who's the master that went on the journey? Who's the man? This is Jesus, clearly. And he's speaking now of his return because the disciples had asked him, what will that day be like when you return? And here's the story that he's telling. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. He's coming and there was going to be a day of settling accounts. I know God is love and I know we want to walk in his grace and in his mercy, but there will come a day of settling accounts. We'll all stand before the Lord. One of the most important things for me as a teacher in the church is to help you to be prepared for that day. I haven't said it recently, but I've said it many times over the months and years. I, you know, that I, the, the, the time for you to realize how screwed up you are is not when you're standing in front of the master. That would be a terrible experience for you. I want you to realize how screwed up you are today, because <laughs> you are. You, not only can't you sing, well, some of you can. You know, not only do you have no rhythm, by the time you leave here, I'm going to get you completely depressed. I mean, that's my goal. You will not leave until I've got you depressed, because then the Lord can say, okay, I can, I can take you out of your misery and raise you up in Christ as a new creation, and I can invest into you because you're a new creation in Jesus Christ. All the old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. But the only way to get there is to be honest with ourselves and to recognize and the phrase I like to use is how screwed up we are, and we are, because this day is going to come. I think a lot of us, maybe right here today, maybe those who, who are joining us on live streaming, we believe this in our heads, but we really don't act on it in our hearts. I think if we would have in our hearts more of an awareness of his return, maybe we'd be more focused on how we're investing in these lives that we've been given. Paul talked about this to the church at Rome in chapter 14, verse 12 of his letter to them. He says, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. That day is going to come. There's no avoiding it. I, I don't want to be afraid of it, but I don't want to assume anything. I want to live my life today in the reality of that day. And I want you to live your life today in the reality of that day. Because I'm going to stand before the Lord and not only give an account of my life, but I'm going to give an account of my teaching. All teachers well. 
It's the duty of the servant to always bear in mind that the master is going to be returning and he's going to be settling accounts with him or with her. Again, John the Apostle said in his letter, 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, Now, dear children, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. Do you think maybe he's even considering or, or, or thinking about this parable that Jesus told? That we could potentially be ashamed at the appearing of Jesus Christ. We want to serve, we want to invest, we want to live the life that we're presently gifted with in the light of a future reckoning. And I think it would help us to get in the habit of asking a very simple question. How will, when it comes to finances, how will my money manage or whatever decision we might make to serve or not to serve or how we're living this life, how will that look on the day of accountability? Not how will I think about it, not how will my spouse think about it, not how will the, you know, someone who's merely human think about it, but what, what do I think the Lord's going to say to me on the day of accountability? I think in your conscience you know the answer to that, so the question is whether it can get from the head to the heart and actually begin to motivate you in the decisions you're making and the actions you're taking, how you speak to people, how you invest this life the way the Lord has entrusted this life for you to invest. Well, let me give you the fifth principle. What we do with what we have reveals our view of God. And this is what Jesus begins to say in verse 20. The man who had received the five talents brought the other, uh, brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. And the master said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. And his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. I, I love that phrase, see. Both of these men, see, here, they're excited to show the master what they had done. See, here, here's how I've lived. Here's how I've invested. Here's the life that as you, you entrusted into my, into my hands, into my care, see, here's what I have done. They're, they're not embarrassed or ashamed to stand in front of their master. And the master increases their resources after they have proven themselves faithful. And Jesus had spoken about this in Luke's gospel, for example. He said, give and it will be given to you. So there's something about faithfulness that then causes the Lord to say, okay, this is a person that I can trust more to. Now, he already knows you. He already knows the actions you're going to take. The question is, are you beginning to know you? And are you beginning to recognize the actions that you're taking, whether they're pleasing or not pleasing to the Lord? These two faithful servants received three key things. They received affirmation, great job, well done. I appreciate the work you've done. Uh, I appreciate your faithfulness. That's the kind of affirmation that I want you to receive and that I would love to receive when I come into the Lord's presence. They received promotion. Now, maybe that's in this life and the next. I don't know. But since you've done so well with what, I'm, what I've given you, the master is is saying, if I may paraphrase it, I'll give you even more responsibility. I'll give you even more opportunity for growth. That's something I want to have follow me into eternity. And then there's celebration. The Lord is saying, you've made me very happy. Let's celebrate together. You got it. You understood why you were on earth. Then, in verse 24, we find the man who had received the one talent. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. <laughs> uh, you know, here's, here's a fellow who was probably very reluctant to meet the master. What's the first thing he says? I knew that you were a hard man. These are the first words out of his mouth. Do you notice the first words out of his mouth are about him? 
I knew something about you. He's still thinking about himself and about what he believes. We could translate this as, I always knew you were not someone that I could completely trust. I always knew. See, the other two guys, they kept their focus on the master when he returned. Master, you entrusted me with this, and here's what I've done. The focus is on the master. But for this man, I knew you weren't who you were pretending to be. I knew. You know, there's this sense that there's something going on in his head, something going on in his thoughts that is corrupting the message of the good news that's been entrusted to him. It seems to me that this third guy has a very distorted view of the master. His mind probably was made up before he even received the talent. So perhaps what we think about God is the most important thing about you and about me. Because if, you know, if we view God as a tyrant, then that's going to filter through everything that we see. If we, if we have this sense that God is not fair and that he's, and that he's, he's going to uh, get angry at us in some way, maybe we somehow received that when we were young in our own upbringing, I don't know. Psychologists wonder about those questions. I don't really know. But clearly it would affect everything that we do and everything. We, if, if you're secretly angry at God because you think he, he, he did something that hurt you or hurt someone else or maybe didn't do something that you thought he should do and you wish he had done, the result is your view of him is going to be very, very skewed. So we have these preconceived notions that prevent us from recognizing our Father as a God of grace and of mercy. And the result is we refuse to serve him with what he's given to us. And we blame God for the problem. We blame God when we bury our own blessings. So our, our faulty view of God can lead us to making all manner of excuses. I've been doing this for going on 40 years as, as a pastor, and I've heard all the excuses that you can ever manage uh, to, to invent. And they always tend to focus back on something that God did rather than what we're doing with the investment that he's uh, made in us and how we are investing that into others or into the generation that we've been born into. This guy's fear has paralyzed him. He's decided to play it safe, so he hides the money to make sure it's not going to be lost. And he accomplishes, by the way, exactly what he set out to accomplish, nothing. You know the old adage, if you aim at nothing, You'll hit it every time, right? That's what this guy has done. So just consider the differences for a moment. We'll be finishing up here in a minute. But two servants who, who have invested, one who hid the talent. The first two determined to make a profit. The third is determined not to take a loss. And we get like that sometimes. Anybody in sports, you know, we're wearing these. I'm wearing a jersey as if I actually play sports. I, I, and here I do. Although I went for a five-mile bike ride on a, on a very bumpy trail with lots of rocks yesterday, and I thought that was pretty uh, amazing. Come on, five miles, bike ride. Yeah. My wife beat me. She was waiting for me at the other end where I finally got there. But I made it. You can't play not to lose. You know, anybody who plays sports, I used to play active sports, you can't play not to lose. That's how you get hurt. You got to play to win. So also in this life as a Christian, we play to win. We don't play not to lose. This guy's playing not to lose. The first two are willing to work hard and take risks. This guy doesn't want to take any risks. The first two received the gift. The third refused the gift. He really refused it. He just took it and buried it in the ground. First two wanted to advance the master's domain. We could think now of the kingdom of God, the body of Christ, the church. The third has no interest in what happens or, or matters to the master. And I think of much of the church in America that's just going about its business every day, in and, in and out of every day, and no interest in what the Lord may want them to do with their lives. The first two viewed the money as an opportunity. The third guy obviously saw it as a problem, and he was going to bury it, make sure he didn't lose any of it. First two allowed the master's gift to change their lives. The third refused to let the gift touch his life. It made no difference in his life. The Lord has gifted each of us. Is it making a difference in our lives, or are we just untouched, unchanged by it? The first two invested. 
The other one, of course, wasted that opportunity to invest. How many Christians will come to that final day realizing they've wasted the opportunity to invest? The first two saw a blessing. The third guy saw a burden, having to carry this. First two knew the master. I think the third guy had no clue really what the heart of the master was. I'm going to come back to that before we finish. But here's the sixth principle. I learned this principle as a brand new Christian many moons ago. I give it to you. It's very easy to remember. Use it or lose it. Use it or lose it. Verse 26, the master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Now he's not saying he is that, but if that's what you believe about me, well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have, uh, have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him, give it to the one who has the ten talents. Had five and now five more, so now has ten. This word wicked actually means evil, hurtful, and malicious. In other words, this master is saying, you are lying. You've been lying to yourself, and now you're going to try to lie to me. And in your heart, you are simply a selfish and lazy person. That is not what you want to hear when you come face to face with Jesus Christ. Jesus goes on to say, or at least the master in the story, if you really wanted to do something, you would have put the money in the bank. You would have maybe got 1% or 2% interest, but you would have got something. In other words, the master is saying, I see right through you. I see your heart. I know what you're doing. And the Lord is this master. And it seems that the Lord will speak to us about both doing wrong and not doing right when we meet him face to face. The other two servants, they're busy working hard. This man digs a hole. He doesn't realize and he's just digging a hole for himself. I'm just convinced that laziness is extremely dangerous to our spiritual lives. The Lord has called us to invest this life. We're given one life to invest it in his purpose, his plan, his intention for us. At whatever point we become aware of who he is and we're born of his spirit into the kingdom of God, that's when you're expected to bring a return on the investment that's been placed into you by the Holy Spirit. We think we could just put it off until later. And eventually we discover that, of course, it's too late. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 9 said, How long will you lie there, <laughs> you sluggard? I've called you all kinds of names today, haven't I? How long will you lie there? Well, this is not, I'm not calling you this, unless it fits. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? When will you engage in this life? When will you begin to do the things that the Lord is entrusting you to do? So let me bring you the seventh principle and we'll finish. There are consequences to our actions and our inactions. There are consequences to our actions, what we do, and the inactions, the things that we were supposed to do but we haven't done. Matthew chapter 25, verse 29, Jesus goes on and he finishes his story. For everyone who has will be given more and he will have and abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. By the way, this concept of weeping and gnashing of teeth is imagery Jesus is using. It comes from the book of Job. You'll find it in the Psalms. You'll find it in the book of Lamentations. All these in the Old Testament, of course, this gnashing of teeth. But in all of those contexts, it's something that those who reject God do in this life. Those who harden their hearts do this in this life. At least that's the context that Jesus is referring from. And what he's saying is if you do that in this life, there's more of the same in the next. When you stand before the Lord and you continue on into whatever is waiting for you. And the key is a lack of serving may indicate I think that a person has never truly become a follower of Christ. I think that's why Jesus referred to this man as worthless. 
I don't think he would do that with someone who is a follower of Christ. I think we have worth because of our faith in Jesus Christ, because we placed our faith in him. We have worth. We don't have worth outside of Christ. We don't have value outside of Christ. That's not Christianity. That's humanism. The belief that somehow the human race and an individual human being has, has this uh, worth in and of itself, in and of himself or herself. We certainly understand the value of a human life, but the worth comes through faith in Jesus Christ when our lives are transformed and the investment that God wants to place into our lives begins to actually bear dividends, if you will, and I'm using, I'm using financial terminology. I just think this servant lived in the house of the master, but he didn't, he didn't love or perhaps not even know the owner. How many people are in churches today across America that are no different? They're in churches, but they have no relationship with the master. And they have no understanding of the stewardship of life, that we have been entrusted with this life as stewards for when the master returns from his journey, and then there, there will be an accounting. But well, let me wrap this up. Let me give you the best definition of stewardship. It's not going to come on the screen, but if you want it, I'll share it with you. Stewardship is best defined as the use of God-given resources for the accomplishment of God-given goals. That's the best I've ever heard. The use of God-given resources for the accomplishment of God-given goals. So how do you line up with these seven principles? Let's put them on the screen. What we have is not ours. We're given what we can handle. We must invest what we've been given. A day of accountability is coming. What we do with what we have reveals our view of God. We must use it or lose it, and there are consequences to our actions and our inactions. I'll kind of close with this story, but how many of you uh, have, have ever watched, I think it's PBS, there's a show called The Antique Roadshow? Uh, Antique Roadshow? I love that show. I, you know, because they come, people come out, they bring in all this stuff, and you find out what it's worth, uh, what they maybe thought it was worth, or what it might sell for, and so forth. I, I find it very interesting. I keep watching, and that people bring their stuff out to these appraisers. Many times, people come on the show. Have you noticed, those of you who watch the show, and they come on the show, and they think they're going to impress the appraiser with what they've got. You know, they've got, they think it's some huge treasure. And more often they find out that it's just worthless. It's, maybe it's a forgery or it's a duplicate and it's worth very little. And they say, oh, no, that can't be. It's been in my family for generations. No, it was a forgery. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's worth nothing. And you see their faces just go. And then there are these others. They have some small trinket or they've got some painting that's up, was up in their, in their dusty attic forever and ever, and they're just, they're just happy to kind of be on the show. They've got a real different attitude, and they find out that that little trinket or that little painting they have is worth a fortune, and they just can't believe it. When I, when I saw that and, and, and watched how it was unfolding again and again on the show, I thought, you know, this is very similar to the accounting that's coming upon the human race. There are a lot of people, too many, I'm sure, who think that they're going to impress God. They're going to impress God with all the great things they've done in this life, whatever that may be. On the other hand, I think there will be those who don't feel that they have much to offer. And what they're going to discover is that their lives were really a treasure to the Lord. And they're going to find that out on that day of accountability. And our responsibility is to use our ability to invest in God's kingdom purposes. All that we are, all that we ever will be, to invest in the purpose and plan of God. Jesus has placed, and I'll close with this, I want you to get it. Jesus has placed his business, that's what this story is all about. He has placed his business into your hands and into my hands and will return someday to judge our faithfulness with his business. And he's heard every excuse imaginable, but he's calling you to partner with him.
and to manage his resources. And that's what this story is about. Let's pray. Father, we come before you now, and we recognize <clears throat> that apart from you, we can do nothing, but in and through you, all things are possible, all things. As we take that which you have invested into our lives, the very life that we've been given, the very breath that we breathe even now is a gift. And Lord, that we might utilize this gift that you've entrusted into our hands, the soul that we have, the life that we're living, that we might invest our time, our treasures, our talents into the work of the kingdom of God, into your purpose, into your plans for our lives. Lord, I pray that every person who has heard this story that your son told so many years ago and that we have opened up and unpacked here in this gathering today, will, I, I know we're going to forget a lot of what's been said. I, that's just how we are as people. But Lord, that we would just remember this, that we have been entrusted with the treasure, with the business of your son, Jesus Christ. And when your son returns, there will be an accounting of what we have done with his business, the church and the kingdom of God and the earth because it all belongs to him. All that we do has been entrusted into our hands for safekeeping. Lord, give us eyes that see and ears that hear. And Father, if there's even one person here today who would say, I really thought that what I had was all that there would ever be. I never thought that the Lord was going to entrust more to me, whether it be five or, or two or one talent. I now recognize that I want to live my life in a way that is pleasing to the Lord so that when I meet him, I will not be ashamed. And if that's you today, pray with me. The only way we draw closer to the Father is through talking to him and through forgiveness and healing in our hearts through faith in Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit entering in and having a moment-by-moment moment dialogue with us as we live this life, as we're directed by the Lord. And so this is your moment to pray. And pray along with me. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I give my life to you. I know you've entrusted so much into me. I want to live my life from this day forward in such a way that you will be pleased with me when I come into your presence. Forgive me for anything I've done that has been less than you desired. And fill me with your Holy Spirit that I might walk with you, hear your voice in my conscience, that your word might jump off the page from the scriptures, that I might see you in the world around me, even in the faces of those that I meet, that I might understand more fully your intention for investing into my life, that I might live with you from this day forward. And I thank you for it. I ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. Praise God. Very common story, <clears throat> common parable from the Lord but a blessing for us today. The um, Lord's Supper is available here in the front for any who wish to receive it, of it. I'm sure that we have the picnic grill going out there. I hope you'll get a chance to come out and, uh, and hang out a little bit, if for nothing else, to watch uh, John take a header as he tries to turn a corner too fast, running a race. I'm not running in any races today, John. I don't think I'm gonna run. I think I just wanna be there to laugh. Uh, Pastor Kevin's up here. There he is. <clears throat> Kevin's over here. You know, if you have any questions about
about what just happened. Maybe you're visiting with us today and you're thinking, well, I, I'd like to know more. We have, uh, we have Bibles we give you. We have a book there. I think it's called More Than a Carpenter. There's another book about understanding Christianity. Uh, any way we can help you. These are free. You just need to come up and talk with Kevin a little bit. Uh, and uh, maybe we can answer some questions for you as well. But whatever we can do to help you uh, in the walk that you have or the desire you have to walk with God, we want to help you with that. Can we stand together, please? I'm going to ask John to come on up and uh, close our gathering in prayer. Again, Lord, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for this message, God. I pray that you continue throughout the week revealing a lot of your truth from the scripture, God, and what we learned today, God, that we would receive your blessing and use it. God, I, right now, I ask, Lord, that you would have reveal the blessings that you are giving to us, God, daily, and that we would be good stewards of that to do your work, to have the opportunity to bless your community and the people around us, Lord. So continue to be with us today as we have fun and eat some food and continue to reveal your presence and power throughout the week. Amen.